Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin Smith. Tonight, as Boko Haram insurgents launch more fatal attacks in northeastern Nigeria, the group's longtime leader releases a new video insisting that he's still in charge. Abubakar Bakr Shakal's word has been dismissed as the rantings of an unstable mind by the army. Also weighed down by an insurgency, plummeting oil prices and attacks on oil installations sees this year Nigeria losing its place as the continent's top economy. Last month it entered into recession. We take a closer look at its economic fortunes. And as the ICC prepares to pass its first judgment for charges of destroying a cultural site, people living in Mali's historic Timbuktu say they're willing to move on from the damage done by jihadists who rampaged through their city. But first, we turn to Nigeria, where eight soldiers were killed in two attacks in northeastern Nigeria over the weekend. Boko Haram extremists first attacked troops at Logomani, about 110 kilometers northeast of Maiduguri, before later launching an ambush on a military convoy near Bama, which lies about 70 kilometers southeast of the city. Now, the raids coincided with the release of a video of the group's longtime leader, Abubakar Shekau. The footage is somewhat of an embarrassment to the Nigerian army, which last month reported that Shekau had been fatally wounded. It's claimed several times in the past to have killed him, only to be publicly proved wrong. The army said the video is the handiwork of a sick and unstable mind. Rosie Koya joins us now with more. Rosie, so tell us a bit more about what Shekau had to say. Well, he seems very preoccupied by the kind of media messaging, as it were, of the group. And he is sticking to the main reasons for the group's uh, insurgency, which is that Western education is forbidden. And so he launches into about 20 minutes worth of ranting, really, about um, really criticising the authorities for reopening schools in Borno. Schools have reopened both secondary and uh, primary. And he goes on to say that uh, these children shouldn't be in school. He doesn't directly uh, make threats to, to harm anybody, but he certainly uh, got a bee in his bonnet, as it were, about school children uh, being back in the classrooms. He also then um, went to another main message of the, the group, which is uh, he has major problems with the leadership of Nigeria. That's uh, the reason for the group having been established in the first place. They see the, the government, whichever government, as uh, corrupt. And so he took the opportunity to, to criticise uh, Buhari, actually calling him a, a cow worshipper. And then also he, his insults then turned to the president of Chad, Idris Deby, who he described as having goat-like eyes. Now, some of this could, of course, been lost in translation. He, he very rarely speaks uh, in English. He, he's much more comfortable in local vernacular languages, and also uh, he, he reads uh, lengthy passages in, in Arabic. Although he did, for the first time in this video, actually speak a little bit English or read some English. And again, that was really uh, talking about um, this issue of the children being in school, and he actually took some time out in the video to uh, actually uh, recite the national anthem, although he got parts of it wrong. Right. Well, so what does this all say about Boko Haram's cohesion? Because in August we saw uh, the IS group saying that it had appointed someone else to be in charge. Shekau was absent from another video which was released less than two weeks ago. What's going on? Is he still running the show? Well, it would appear so in, in the fact that uh, he manages to release these videos regularly. I mean, the last one was uh, in the beginning of August. And um, the cer certain that in these videos, he, he definitely has a sort of online, uh, an on-screen rather presence, as it were. Um, and, you know, he, his face is known across the world now because of the kidnap of these uh, Chibok schoolgirls. But ultimately, last month, as you said in your introduction, there was um, a new leader or a person came forward calling himself Abu Masub al-Badawi, who is uh, the son of the Boko Haram's founder. And he apparently is uh, the favoured choice of uh, the IS group, so the Islamic State armed group. And this person uh, made his own video with uh, other people in it, uh, claiming that he had now taken over leadership. But uh, Shekau is not having any of this, and he uh, continues, as I say, to sort of wage this YouTube jihadism. But the thing with, G with the Rosie? other YouTube... 
Rosie, yes. unfortunately, that is all we have time for. I'm going to have to cut you off there. But thank you very much. Rosie Collier there for us in Abuja on the latest uh, video released by uh, Abu uh, Boko Haram's longtime leader, Abu Bakr Shekel. Well, staying with Nigeria, the insurgency has waved head weighed heavily on the country's economy, along with plummeting oil prices and a rise in attacks on crude installations. This year, it lost its place as the continent's top economy and, to make matters worse, last month entered into recession. Nigeria's real estate in crisis. Ayodele Oshobajo is the manager of a construction company. Previously, he worked in Lagos, but he was forced to relocate to Abuja. Work on construction sites in Nigeria's economic capital has stopped due to rising costs. I'm not really surprised at what is going on. We, we saw it coming from afar, from the, from the way the oil price was dropping. I, I, and I'm prepared for this. And I, I think I will survive this. Ayodele may be optimistic, but Nigeria's economy is going through its worst crisis in decades as a result of falling oil prices. For this currency exchange office in Lagos, 2016 has been a terrible year. The company saw its revenue plummet and had to cut staff. $50,000 should be given to each broody change per week. But as I tell you, the banks, even at times, they will debit two, three weeks, they've not given you the phone. It's affecting our business. We are practically not doing much as it is now. Nigeria's currency was devalued in June, but the effects on the economy were limited. Foreign currency reserves have dropped and import prices have increased. Experts say it's time for Nigeria to rethink its development model and reduce its dependence on oil. I think the federal government should try and support the small-scale industry because they are the driver of the economy. And this will increase the number of made-in-Nigerian goods and also promote made-in-Nigerian goods uh, consumption. With its economy in tatters, Nigeria has lost its status as Africa's largest economy. An international conference on wildlife protection is underway in Johannesburg. The Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Fora, or CITES, is tackling a range of threats faced by endangered animals. Now, it got underway on Saturday in highlighting the plight of African elephants, whose population has fallen drastically over the last decade because of illegal hunting. Conservationists have pointed out that they should be treated and protected as a precious continental asset. Researchers have also raised the issue of the human cost of combating poachers after rhino's horns. Calling human cost to all of this, um, there's a cost to rangers, rangers who are working long hours, who strung out, who overstressed, who underpaid, um, soldiers who've been killed, at least seven soldiers have died in the park, many of them in, in, in two tragic accidents. Um, there are two field rangers and a policeman who were killed, and around 150 to 200 suspected poachers, many of them breadwinners from the communities that they originated from. People living in Mali's historic Timbuktu say that they're willing to move on from the damage done by jihadists who rampaged through their city. On Tuesday, Ahmed al-Faki al-Mahdi will be sentenced at the International Criminal Court. He's pled guilty to the war crime of destroying shrines at the UNESCO World Heritage Site. Ahmad al-Faki al-Mahdi was head of al-Qaeda-linked Ansar Deen's Hizbar Brigade, which policed so-called un-Islamic behaviour in Timbuktu after they took over the city in 2012. He's pleaded guilty to directing attacks that destroyed 14 mausoleums, dating back to the 15th and 16th centuries. We are witnessing a war crime, a crime against humanity, since the heritage in question bears the social, political and intellectual memory of a country, of a region and of a city that is a centre of wisdom for all of sub-Saharan Africa. Al-Mahdi says he seeks forgiveness for his crimes, but prosecutors have called for up to 11 years in prison. The trial goes beyond the penalties that we can impose on Mohamed al-Mahdi. There's also a didactic, pedagogical dimension. It's necessary that the trial sends out the message that just as you can't kill another human with impunity, so you can't destroy a sanctuary of our global heritage. Since the attacks, UNESCO and the Malian government have rebuilt the tombs at Timbuktu. Last week, conservationists unveiled the fully restored doors of the 15th century Sidi Yahya Mosque. And residents here say they're ready to forgive. 
If he asks for forgiveness, we will accept it because we are believers. We just want peace to come and justice to be done, that's all. But although the tombs have been rebuilt, the city remains under the watch of Islamist and criminal gangs. And many fear that the imprisonment of Al Mahdi won't make Mali any more secure. And that's it for Iron Africa for now. Thanks very much for joining us. Please do so again. Take care.